Sometimes I feel like it's GT against the world. The other day I posted on my Instagram an image that I don't even feel should be controversial. It just said, there is enough for all. And it's a quote from a book called Rabbit Hill by Robert Lawson. And I got a response from a teacher who said that she's a GT specialist, a new one, at a school where there's not a lot of interest in GT. And what she wanted to know was, what do I do when this is the case? She said, you know, it, there's there are under-identified students here, no real interest in serving the kids, all the focus is on low achieving students, the school is an underperforming school, um, it's got a large immigrant population, the school has about 650 kids and fewer than 30 are identified as gifted. The person she's replacing said there's not a ton of, of interest or support in the program, what do you do? Well, first, we have to look at the big issue here, which is way bigger than this one school. I am not in any way picking on this school or on this school district. This is a huge problem in gifted education. So first, let's look at the problem that exists in GT education, which if the thumbnail didn't give it away is it sometimes feels like it's GT against the world. The second thing that we're going to look at is the identification situation. Are there kids being under-identified here, unidentified? What should the numbers be at a school this size? And then thirdly, what I would do specifically if I were her. So if I were a, like a GT specialist coming into a campus where there wasn't a lot of support for GT and there was a lot of focus on other issues, what would I do to make it feel like less, I guess make it feel less like, you know, dukes up? Okay, so first, this big issue. Most schools and most school districts are operating, you know what, most countries, most people, most planets are operating under the logical fallacy that gifted and talented and supporting struggling students are competing interests, when really they're not. Often there's this idea of, oh, we'll worry about gifted and talented kids once we've accomplished XYZ, and yet somehow XYZ never happens. Part of the problem with this is there is no federal mandate to meet the needs of gifted kids like there is for students who have learning differences that we call disabilities. Now, interestingly, the state that this teacher is in does have a state mandate. So there is a mandate there it's just not federal. And when it's not federal, then it doesn't have quite the power. Gifted and talented often, I say this, GT stands for good teaching. So gifted and talented need not be a competing interest on a campus. Best practices benefit all learners. Teachers who have been trained in gifted ed and in meeting the needs of gifted students, understand the social emotional issues that come along with learning differences. They understand how to try multi-modalities in order to reach, reach a wide range of abilities. Like all of these things are things that benefit everyone. We are not in competition. We are all on the same page. This is a collaborative game. This is not an adversarial situation. When we try to identify gifted kids when we are actively seeking like like talent scouts rather than gatekeepers when we are actively seeking to identify and pull kids into the life raft of gt who need to be there who would otherwise drown then we have to provide the petri dish for their ability to grow and i've just mixed a metaphor of like the titanic versus um, a science lab, but okay, I wish you could see it. My husband knows I'm recording and his like work notification just went off and he ran across the office to try not to interfere. But you know what? This is life. So when we try to identify, we have to have a good situation for all kids to grow. And when we do that, it often raises many, many, many other kids along with the GT. There's that saying, a rising tide lifts all boats. And I think it's somewhat pat, I think it's somewhat trite, 
but that doesn't make it less true. So the key here is that serving gifted kids is good for the whole population. It gets parents involved in schools, which is always a good thing. It's not just about a small group of kids on a campus who are already a guaranteed good test score. It is about a campus community. No system can really be considered effective if it ignores the needs of a minority population or rejects those needs altogether. We will never survive, much less thrive, as a school system, and whether that system is a campus, a classroom, a district, a state organization. We will never survive if we say that our survival is dependent upon the lack of survival or concern of an entire population of students on the campus. That will never be a viable option. So we have to embrace the big overarching idea that it ought not be GT against the world. It ought to be, you know what? Let's make sure we're meeting the needs of our gifted kids and guess what? Good things will happen for everyone. All right, so let's tackle this identification issue. Now, are these numbers out of whack? 650 kids on a campus, fewer than 30 identified as gifted. Well, you can't really answer this question. I mean, the number may sound low, but you can't really answer this question unless you do some math. So pull out your phone so you can get the calculator app and let's do some math. Now, first we have to figure out what are we identifying? Let's say we want the top 5% of kids in a gifted program. On a campus the size of 650 kids, that would be 32.5 students. So we're pretty close. Like if we've got 30 identified and we need 32.5, we're really close, right? But if we wanted the top 8%, then we're under identifying. We have to look also at what does this district use to identify who should be qualifying? Because maybe we're not just looking at the top 5%, maybe we have a different range. This district uses local norms. What that means is that when they test students to see if they qualify for gifted and talented, they are not comparing those students to national norms. All of these tests that are used have national norms, meaning how do you compare to the other students your age, and by age they typically use a three month window. So if you are 11 years and three months old, how do you compare to other kids who are like 11 years, zero to three months old, or three to six months old? Now what this district does is that they use local norms. They're using comparisons of that student, not to the whole country, but rather to other kids on their campus and in their school district. This practice is a common way to address perceived or real inequity in a system, and I'm not a 100% fan, which I'll explain later why, but if they're using local norms, then yes, I would say there is an under-identification issue on this campus, and let's dive into why I say that's true. So in this school district, in order to qualify for gifted services, kids have to do one of the following. First, they have to score in the 95th percentile or above in two of the three domains of the evaluation instrument that's given. Now, um, the evaluation instrument that they're using is one of the accepted, generally used, widely known, well-normed, well-researched abilities tests. It is not an IQ test, it's an abilities test. Like others of its kind, it has three parts. It has a verbal, a quantitative, which is math, and a non-verbal, non, non it, it's like general thinking ability, essentially. So they're saying, if you score, we don't even need you to have a standard age score, meaning we take how you do in all three sections and see how you do. No, they only have to score in the 95th percentile in two of the three domains using national norms or in the top 5% of their campus, which is essentially the same thing, in two of the three domains of their campus norms or or top 5% of allowable subpopulations. So you might, and it says allowable subpopulations. I don't know what their allowable subpopulations are. They would probably be recognized ones, like, right, like they're gonna be a specific ethnic group, something like that. 
in two of the three subdomains using district norms, which are, so what they're saying is, you do not have to be in the top 5% overall, not only not compared to the whole country, but even compared to your campus, you only need to be that, the top 5% of your campus in two of the three tests. This is a very, very, very wide net. I mean, wide. It really doesn't get much more wide than this. This is a very, very generous. You really can't expand this anymore and still call it a GT program. In fact, I'd argue that this isn't actually a GT program per se, per se as much as it is um, we're gonna identify the high stability kids in our district and on our campuses, which is a valid, goal, um, although here's where I have an argument with local norms. So I know, I know I'm probably going to get a hate tweet from a couple of people because I am not a huge fan of local norms. Now I understand, I understand completely what they are. I've read the research. I know that NAGC has wants everyone to drink the local norm Kool-Aid. I understand that. I totally understand that, and I understand the rationale. I totally understand the desire to address inequity in a system, totally. But here's why I'm not totally sold on local norms. The first reason is that it creates a program that is not actually a gifted and talented program. It creates a program that is a talent development program. That is not quite the same. A gifted program, in my mind, says gifted children have special needs. They're, they think differently. They approach things differently. They have some social emotional needs that go along with it, particularly the more profoundly gifted they get. Now, some of the people who are super in favor of local norms don't believe in that. And so they're like, no, that's not true, Lisa. Prove it. Prove it. Give me your data. And you know what? I've got case studies. I've got so many case studies. They all call me mom. But no, I mean, that's that's an oversimplification. There is research. There is definitely research in the social emotional needs of the gifted. But the fact is, is that if we're saying we're, we're not really worried about whether you're gifted compared to kids across the whole country, we're only concerned about how you compare to other kids in our campus or our school district, that's not truly a gifted program necessarily. In fact, it can work the other way because in some school districts, their local, if they used local norms, their local norms would be much more stringent than national norms because they have a huge cluster of gifted kids. I've worked with a school district in my state where I would say arguably if they used national norms, they'd identify more than 25 or 30 percent of their campus, of, of their district, if they used national norms. So if they use local norms, then nobody would get in, right? Because you'd, you'd, you'd have to score in the 99.8 percentile in order to get in if they used local norms. So local norms can be a two-edged sword. All right, next, another reason why I'm not a huge fan of local norms. I think people get unreasonable expectations. If you tell a teacher, oh, this kid has been identified as gifted and talented, then they expect that kid to behave in the way that what we would consider a typical gifted kid to behave. They're gonna have very high expectations of that student's performance. And when those kids don't live up to that expectation, they can lose faith in the entire program. They can get further entrenched in the idea that GT services are bogus. They don't, they don't even believe in it. They're like, they identified this kid as GT and he can't even do X, Y, Z, right? Next, um, try to tell a parent that their kid is gifted in school district A, but not school district B. And that happens with local norms. It happens where a kid gets identified for a program in one school district that use local norms, they move to another school district that uses national norms, and that school district says, sorry, Charlie, only good tasting Kuntuna gets to be star kissed. And now we have a really big problem, uh, like, the, like we flipped your gifted switch. I think that because of that, it's better to call, if you're gonna use local norms, because you really want to capture, like you've got a large underserved population, you really want to capture them, you really want to develop that talent and see what can grow, you really are committed to equity, I am 100% on your team. I am 100% team equity. But what I would say is, don't call it a gifted program. 
Call it a talent development program. Call it whatever you want to call it, but don't call it that. The reason is the term is so laden with with so many connotations and so much stuff. I mean, people in the gifted community argue whether the name even serves the gifted community. So if you're going to expand it to say it's going to include the top kids in a group, even if none of them, not one of them, would qualify for gifted under national norms, you're really, you're really on the edge. You're about to jump the shark of whether you can call it a gifted program or not. So I would say I would be totally on board with local norms if they were not used for something called a GT program, but rather a separate program called something else so that we make sure that we don't have confusion, we don't have resentment, we don't have kids developing imposter syndrome because they were gifted yesterday and they're not gifted tomorrow. And then also we don't conflate the issues that we have of serving gifted kids versus serving high ability kids. So here's where the problem comes in though, because according to district policy, in this particular situation, they should be identifying 5% of the campus in two of the three domains, which is actually going to be slightly higher than 5% of the campus because it's sections of the test, not the whole thing. So I would take the top 5% of that campus in verbal, even if that type top 5% were not even, like we're in the first standard deviation, like they don't even have to be high ability really. I'm just gonna look at the top 5% of this campus and, in, and they only have to be in two of the three domains, you're gonna have at least 5% of the campus. In that case, we're under identifying because not all of the campus will have been given the test. We're not testing usually kinder. Sometimes they are, but I don't think they are. So you're gonna need slightly higher of the top 5%. Um, and so I think, yes, they're under identifying, but not egregiously so, not egregiously so. With these numbers, I would guess that you're under identifying, uh, there's probably six or seven more kids. So it's not it's not that big of a deal. If you're looking at five, I mean, every kid who goes unidentified is a big deal, but if you're looking at a campus of 60, 650 and you should have identified like 32 to 35 kids and you identified 27 or 28, you're not that far away. So it's not like we don't need to go to DEF CON 1. There is under identification according to policy, but but it's not egregious. Some of that's going to happen in schools that are struggling because there's transients. So you may have identified, I don't mean transients in the sense of like homeless people, but transients in the sense of um, people who are in lower socioeconomic statuses and income brackets tend to move more often. And um, so if I test you and I identify you as gifted using local norms, but then you move, I've lost you and maybe I'm not tested again. So on campuses where there is a lot of transient student population, then what you're going to need to do is make sure that you're testing more frequently than you would on a campus where students aren't moving around as much, where I would say every year, every new kid gets tested. That's what I would say. Okay, so third part. <laughs> what I would do in this teacher situation. Number one, I would watch. I would, I'm new to the campus and the worst thing I could do is come in like a boulder and just wipe out everything, like with my superior knowledge. Uh, don't do that. I, I don't think you would. I don't even know the teacher personally, but I don't think they would. But I would watch. I would provide services to the kids who have been identified and I would provide fantastic services to them. I would spend the first semester just watching, learn the school, learn the social ecosystem of that school. Who has power? Who is a jerk who actually needs to quit teaching before they do real harm? What are the programs in place and how are they working? Where do the GT kids fit in the school as a whole? I would consider reading Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Tipping Point because that will help you identify the people you need to get on your side. It isn't the whole school. You don't need the whole school. You only need a few people. So read the tipping point and it will help you identify who those people are you need. 
Make it clear to anyone who seems at all interested that you recognize that you need to get to know the school and the feel of the school before you can figure out the best way to be of service to the school. Make sure that you make a point to share that with the administrative team. Understand that administrative teams on schools that are in schools that are struggling are under tremendous top-down pressure. Their jobs are on the line, and but more than that, most administrators care desperately about the success of students. And so if you know that your school is not performing according to the standards that it needs to meet, you know that behind every one of those numbers is a kid in danger of not getting the education they need in order to be successful in life. In, and by successful, I mean just being able to graduate from high school and support themselves. And so those administrators reasonably have a concern. Make sure that they know that you share that concern. Make sure that they know that you understand and that you feel that by better serving the high ability kids on this school, it's going to help everyone that you have bought into their same mission and you're wanting to help and willing to help. During this time, during this first semester time, I'd share cool tips, cool resources with teachers, not in a pushy way, but rather in a, hey, saw this, thought you could use it kind of way. I'd look over the testing that has already been done and I would identify the kids who should have been identified and haven't been. That's low hanging fruit. I'm not saying that the person who was there before you didn't do a good job, but it's possible that kids were in another campus or even another school district and and have that test in their folder who may not have qualified in a different campus or a different district, but qualify under these norms. Qualify under your campus norms. Understand that if you're on a really struggling campus that's using campus norms, your campus norms are going to be far more generous than students will have experienced in previous schools. So look at all those QM folders and make sure that you're not missing anybody. You're probably going to pick up on five or six more kids, which is going to pull you right into where you should be as far as identifying. This district this district uses the whole school cluster model. So just make sure that's happening. That's one of the things I feel like is an easy win here. The whole school cluster model, for those who aren't familiar, is where we say, all right, we've got, you know, a, a grade level of 100 kids and there are six identified gifted kids in this grade level. We're going to put three gifted kids in each of two fourth grade classes. Right, so there's a cluster of gifted kids so that I don't have one gifted kid in this class, one in this class, and like a bunch of them alone. I'm going to have clusters. In fact, I would argue if you have fewer than six, if you have fewer than six in a grade level, put all of them in one class. I put like if I have five gifted kids or fewer, I would put them all with one teacher. That would be true to the whole school cluster model. And so one of the things I would look at is talk to the admin team and say, um, in order to meet, in this case, a state law, we need to make sure that we are um, using this whole school cluster model. So how can I help whoever is doing the master schedule to make sure that we are doing that. And in, and in our state, it, you can tell, in, and in that state, you can tell by just the, in the computer system whether a kid's been identified as gifted or not. The last thing I would do this first semester is I would use that GT time, like if you're serving a GT pullout time, I would use that to build on what is happening in class, taking them deeper so you don't seem competitive. You don't want the kids coming to your GT class and doing super cool stuff like raising sea monkeys or making crystals, and then they go back to class and tell everybody else that's what they did, and now all the kids are mad at their teacher because they were practicing math facts. You're just going to need to find a cooler way to practice math facts, right? A deeper way. Use the depth of complexity model. Use lots of different kinds of things. But when your GT kids go back to their regular class, what they need to be bringing with them is the idea to the teacher and the other students that we worked on the same kinds of things that you worked on. It can't, you cannot set yourself up as that GT stands for super cool and amazing while everybody else is bored, right? You, you will... Um, not win friends and influence people that way. All right, then 
after a semester, I start making micro offers. I'd offer short 15 minute PD opportunities on how to do something really cool and let teachers start counting those towards their required hours. You'll need to talk to the administrator about that. Um, share photos or stories about the kids in GT and what they're doing. Um, I don't recommend doing this right away because it can seem like, look how cool I am. But after a semester, I think it's fine to say, hey, just want to touch base with you. Here's some stuff about what we did. I don't know if this can help you with your, you know, teacher evaluation or any documentation that you're keeping or if you'd like a copy of it because you think there might be some kids in your class who could benefit from it. Next, offer to help teachers with lessons that they want to do that require another set of hands. Now, I understand that this is going to require a lot of time, but I promise you, if you are in classrooms, you will better see where the need is. And if you are seen as a helper rather than a competitor, it helps everyone. Next, keep super, super, super good track of data. What? Watch the test scores of the kids who get identified and see if they rise. Schedule regular meetings with administrators in this perspective of helper. How can GT strategies assist all students? What's working for you that might work for everyone? I also think it's impo important to set program goals for what you want to accomplish. How many kids do you want to ID? Like look at, look at it and say, all right, looking at our campus, we want to identify X number of kids. How are you going to support these parents? How are you going to make sure these parents are connected with stuff? How are you going to provide resources to teachers? Can you get teachers some good PD? Is there any money? You're probably at a Title I school. Are there Title I funds that can be used? Title I funds can be used to serve gifted when there is gifted population that is also Title I, right? So can, the, can some of those Title I funds be used for, for good PD or good manipulatives? or something like that, where you, you can be advocating for all kids. You have to be able to quantify and qualify how you will know it's working. You will not be able to get buy-in unless you can show results. And so you're going to have to quantify what and qualify what those results will look like. And I think you need to do that in conjunction with the principal. And I think the time to do that is not when school is in session and not two weeks before school. I think the time to do that is early, early, early in the summer, like as early as you can in the summer to say, what what will success of this program look like and how can this program benefit the goals of the campus at large? I would reevaluate at the end of every single year. And at the end of every year, I would get just a little bit more assertive. This is going to be a slow burn. I would guess that it will take about five years in order for you to get to the point where most of the teachers have bought in. You're never going to get them all. You're never going to get them all, but maybe 70%. It's almost like herd immunity, right? It's like you just need a certain amount, right? You don't need that many. You just need a couple in each grade level and you will make a huge difference. But I think it will take at least five years until you get the number that you need on board with you and until the program is really making a difference. So don't get discouraged if you're not noticing a big change the first couple of years. I would, I would really watch and be patient. But after five years, you should be seeing some pretty significant change in the attitudes towards the program, some pretty significant change in that you're not going to have to go hunting um, gifted and talented kids like a hunter gatherer, um, but rather that, that it's going to be just part of the school's normal process. And also that teachers are used to coming to you for suggestions and that you are very comfortable in the classrooms and they're comfortable having you there. So those are my suggestions probably a little bit more than you expected when I get a direct message on Instagram. But the fact is, I think this this question that you're asking is a very important question. It's important to a lot of people. So hopefully this has been helpful to you and hopefully more than just you. Um, this idea that gifted kids and gifted programs, it's them against the world, is a false dichotomy and it needs to stop. We can serve gifted kids and 
not do it at the expense of helping a school, even a struggling school, be successful. In fact, quite the contrary. When we serve the needs of our gifted students, we will help all students. And the sooner that everybody gets on board with that, the better. Thanks so much for asking this question and best wishes to you.